And I don't know that I mentioned this to you or not, forgive me if I have, but if you notice the little Bible up here, we placed it here because um, when we removed the cornerstone out here a couple years ago, there was a hole in the wall. And this Bible and some other artifacts were in there. And uh, it's very, very old, as you can see. And uh, Hamp and I just thought, boy, that'd be kind of neat to put that on display out here in front of the church. And so I don't know how many years ago that was put in, probably when the building was built, I guess, evidently. And, uh, but the Bible itself was, at least looks like a copywriter back in the 1800s. It's so small, you better have uh, extra heavy bifocals on to, to be able to read it. But if you do come to look at it, touch it gently because it's really falling apart. But that's what that is, and that's, well, that's why we put it up here. Just kind of a neat connection with our past from a lot of years ago. When we uh, put the new cornerstone out there, we also put some information in there. I put a letter in there and uh, a couple other things, I guess. I think we stuck another Bible in there, if I remember right. Um, just so you know. Anyway, been meaning to mention that and just haven't done that. So just, just for your information there. All right. Well, what a blessing it is to gather today. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and then we'll look at his word. Father, our hearts are joyful this morning as we come together uh, once again as brothers and sisters under you in your name. Thank you for our week, as challenging as it has been for many of us. Uh, through various conditions of, of life, whether it be through sickness or just job-related things or relationships or whatever they might be. Uh, we're not unaware this morning of all the struggles, and so we also are very well aware of your presence with us. And so we come today to honor you, to lift your name up, to pour our hearts out before you, to hear from you, and so do just that, Lord. Open our hearts this morning that we might hear your voice in us through your word. Lord, may you use our emotions this morning even to touch us so that we may know that we've met with you today. And so, Lord, we just ask you to come and be with us. We know that your word teaches us you are always with us, but we would ask a special touch this morning as we gather as your people. May we be a light in this community as we're gathered here today, that if nothing else, by our gathering, the world will be driving by and they will see that there's something unique about you and, and your work in us. And so we ask for your presence again, Lord, in your work. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so up on the screen again, we just want to keep going through this. I, I have many more thoughts about a disciple's life, and I'm trying to figure out how many of these we want to continue on with. I suppose we could go for a long time, uh, but I do want to continue with some thoughts, at least for the next several weeks, on the life of a disciple. And we'll just kind of, I'm just praying each week about what the Lord would have us to look at uh, as time goes by. But I do want to keep this definition in front of you, as you see on the screen there, because I just want you to continually have this vision in your mind about what a disciple is. So a disciple is part-time, right? It's not what the screen says. That's not what the Bible says. A disciple is a full-time, exclusive apprentice. In other words, we're not learning a bunch of spiritual things from everybody else out there. We're learning from Jesus how to live in this life effectively. We don't want to waste our time, do we? I don't like wasting my time. Life is too busy. And there's too much at stake, at risk. So we want to be effective in advancing his kingdom. And we want to train ourselves to become the kind of people who just by routine, we just know this is what's the best thing to do, as far as the scripture says, from our hearts, not just our head, but from our heart, all that Jesus says. We want to do everything. So continue, continually just want to keep that in your mind, all right? All right, now, I need to break up this a little bit differently this morning. I kind of have two thoughts going on simultaneously. I feel like there are times where I need to address certain things just for clarity's sake, uh, as far as the world and the church is concerned. And just the other day, uh, speaking of which, someone sent me an article by a man named John Pavlovitz. I think I'm saying that name right. It was a couple years old, but I wanted to share it with you because it's really very interesting uh, let me just read it, and I think you'll see why. Here's the title of it. Things I'm doing before going to hell. He says, I'm going to hell. I know this because it's clear to me. 
My beliefs about the Bible, my full affirmation of the LGBTQ community, my criticisms of the American church, and in parenthesis he has even my questions about the very existence of hell itself, all apparently ensure that I'm headed there once I reach my expiration date here. And believe me, I'm not thrilled about it, but hey, they're Christians, and they must know these things or they wouldn't make such claims about the eternal destination of my soul, right? That would just be cavalier and arrogant and reckless, the most irresponsible kind of religion. I used to argue with these folks when they tossed damnation grenade Bible verses at me. I'd fire back in vigorous defense, challenging their hermeneutic. That's just the belief system. Questioning their theological conclusions and passionately making the case for myself. I don't do that very much these days. Now I just assume that they're right. I resign myself to the hot and humid forever fate they've so willingly prescribed for me. And since I know how my, how my story ends, at least I can use whatever time I have left wisely and stay busy. Now I'm just not going to read all of this because it's a little lengthy, but here's what he says. So before I go to hell, I'm going to give all people as much grace as I'm able, knowing that they're very likely as much, as, as much of a daily frazzled, freaked out mess as I am. I'm going to look relentlessly and deeply for the good and even the most seemingly unlikable human beings because I believe this goodness is embedded there somewhere in each of them. I'm going to live my faith as best as I can at any given moment with all the inconsistency, hypocrisy, doubt, vacillation that endeavor may come with. I'm going to speak defiantly into bigotry and hatred, especially when they come delivered in the name of God because sadly that is often when they are most likely to go unopposed. I'm going to let people know that they matter and belong and have value, not if they get their act together, not when they sandblast off their rough edges, not once they clean up their, their lives, but as they are right now. And he goes on to talk like that in a lot more ways. And he says here towards the end, I'm doing them, I'm going to do these things because loving people as I desire to be loved is the best way I know of reiterating Jesus in the world. I'm doing them because restoration and redemption are not cloistered religious relics save for church buildings. They're the loud, messy places faith invites us to live here and now. I'm doing them because I don't believe this life is a meaningless holding area before something better, but the sacred chance to make something better with this day and this breath, this breath and this place. It's a very interesting article, isn't it? I was intrigued by that uh, because you kind of hear two sides of the mind there. On the one hand, there's this awareness that there is some rationality to uh, this God out there. And then there's also some thought about how we should be living in this life. If I didn't read the first part there, you'd say, gosh, this person's a Christian. They should, that's exactly how believers should be living. So as I read this, I thought we need to discuss just for a moment here the real thing that's happening. And I think you all know this, is that the problem is for many people out there like John, uh, we'll just call him, create Christianity to be something that the Bible does not speak of. Unfortunately, the world looks at us as a real problem because the world judges Christianity and the Bible by you and me. And unfortunately, we fail the world a lot of times. And so it's a real wake-up call if you're paying attention to this kind of thing at all because um, you're hearing much more loudly the voice, at least in our lifetime, the cry against the the things of God that we are saying are the things of God, the truths of God. But we need to be really careful, I think, in making sure that we're really proclaiming the God of the Bible, right? Right? I mean, let's just be honest. There is a spiritual box that God defines for us. Isn't that true? I mean, the spiritual box is that we're to live holy before the Lord. I mean, there's no question about that. What we have to be careful of is that as we're dialoguing and communicating with the world is that we're clarifying what the box is. It's not about, and I hope you already know this, I'm just reiterating some things for us, is that Our job is to understand that we are as broken as anybody else. But it's only because of the grace and the saving work of Christ that we can live in any kind of box that God has created, which is the box of holiness. Right? Does that make sense to you? 
And so I just want to throw these thoughts out there this morning as you think about your work in people's lives, that you work hard, just like I need to work hard, to make sure that we don't waver from the truth, that God has clarified for us what the parameters of holy living is, and understanding that we can only be what God wants us to be and have the home in heaven that he has created for us because of his work. He's the one that's done it all. It's our role to help people to see not the specific sins of their lives, but they are just simply like we are, lost without Christ. That becomes the real emphasis. So it doesn't, I mean, there are, we could dis- define and discuss for lengths of time about the different sins that there are out there. The real issue is not so much that when it comes to dealing with the things of the world. The real issue is where is the person's heart in relationship to what God has said about himself. So again, I would like to say to a guy like John, this is not the God of the Bible. What you're doing is you're looking at the people. Now, this is where it becomes challenging, though. You're looking at the people who profess to be Christians, and you're defining who God is from what you're seeing in the people. And that's a real eye-opener for us. And so again, I'm just simply reminding us this morning, number one, is that we've got to be careful how we're portraying ourselves to others. I'm not talking about wavering from the truth. I'm talking about being very clear in the truth, but loving and gracious at the same time. Does that make sense? So that when people look at us as believers, they're able to say, here is the definition of a true believer. They understand that they're lost as I am. But they've trusted Christ to save you. You see, Christ is the emphasis, right? And see, see, uh, that's why we, um, nobody is without sin. That's exactly right. And that's even us at times. We don't do it right either. That's right. Thank you, Peggy. So, she's exactly right. That's all of us. We have to be careful about our lives, and we have to be cautious and watching our lives. Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 1, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance. I love how he says that. But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior. So at least for me and for us as a church here, I hope that what we're really thinking about as we look into the lives of the world here, that we're careful to be specific and to understand what God is really saying in his word about holy living. But we're not pointing a bony finger at people and telling them what's wrong with them and not looking at our own hearts. Let me show you one other chart here. Now, those of you who've been in our class on Wednesday nights recognize the name Paul Miller. He's the guy who's done the book. I just want to show something here. I don't have my pointer with me, but I'll stand off to the side. I hope you can see this okay. He writes this in a little diagram sense. Here's where we've come in the world sense. The circle on the left is, if you notice the lines there, it says Jesus' divinity. There was a time where the world, for all intensive purposes, accepted the divinity of Jesus in certain aspects. But But then there came a time where that was marked out, and what they really wanted was just the life of Jesus. Not Jesus himself, but the life of Jesus. What's shifted now in our day is the next side over, which is no longer does the world want the divinity or the Godhead of Jesus. No longer does the world want the humanity of Jesus. In other words, leave Jesus out of everything. Don't even bring his name up. What the world wants is what Jesus brings, though. Notice compassion, inclusion, peace initiatives, women's rights, immigrants' rights, disability rights, the poor, Racial justice. Well, that's certainly Bible. In fact, Jesus was the greatest proponent of women's rights that there ever was. But here's how it's gotten convoluted. Paul Miller brings out the fact that the abortion issue that we've been so hotly seeing in the, in the world this, uh, lately, and especially here in Virginia, has come about because of the world's stance on women's rights, which Jesus was a huge proponent of. I'm not talking about the abortion part for Jesus, but I'm talking about the women's rights. But what they've done is they've deified the rights of women to the point now where what Jesus would really say is in the life of the person, they've thrown out the baby, you see, for the sake of the right of the other person. And this is where the world has gotten really off track. So what we've got to do is we've got to make sure that we're giving them the entire picture of it all. And that requires some work on our parts. 
We have to be thinking. We have to know what the Scripture says. We have to know our God. We have to know what he teaches and what he wants from us so that we can accurately give it to people. We've got to not just change their minds, but we've got to point them to the Jesus of the Bible. Okay, so it's one thing to tell a person, you need to be born again. But what we're really saying to them is, yes, you need to be born again, but what we're really asking them to do is, this is the repentance thing. I'm walking this way in my life, but you need to turn and go to Jesus. He is the one who is the focus of all of this. Not just a changing of the mind, not just a changing of the actions, but that we are literally seeing Jesus as the one who has rescued us. He's the reason why we're changed and why we've become new creations. Yes, the Spirit of God has come into us, but He is the reason why we have changed. Okay? So as you're witnessing to people, because I've been talking a lot about this, and you know this just as believers, this is what our role is, that we have to make sure we're giving the full picture. Yes, we need to be saved. But what are we saved from? We're saved from the sin, the penalty that keeps us separated from whom? From Jesus. But he is the gracious one. Just listen to these verses. When Moses was in the wilderness and God had given to him the Ten Commandments, this is what happened in Exodus 34. The Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed this about himself. The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. Yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. See, that's the message that people like John need to hear. They need to hear the full story. It's not just one-sided. There's nobody just pointing a finger at you the finger, if nothing else, is pointing back at the individual saying, listen, I found Christ. He set me free of the sin that I owe him. And you need to see him as well. He's kind and gracious, but he will not stand for the sin that works in us. Okay? Just felt like I needed to give you that this morning. That's a little bit of a freebie for you. Okay? You don't have to pay any extra for that this morning. So hopefully that will be of help in some way. All right, let's, let's move on here now because we've been looking at King David's life with Bathsheba to help us understand what is going to happen if we don't master our sinful will. And we've pretty much finished that. We saw the devastation that sin creates from those messages and from looking at his life. If you weren't able to listen to those, you can go back on our website and see those and listen to those again. But what we understood is that sin doesn't have to keep us from being used by God. Now, what we really didn't get to last week, and I'm just going to mention it right here, is that if you know the scripture at all, or maybe you don't, David, after all of that sin, was still greatly used by God. In fact, guess who came from the line of David? The Lord Jesus. Which is a beautiful picture of the work of the Lord and the grace and the compassion of the Lord. You remember David confessed he repented of the sin when Nathan came to him. And we learn in the Gospel of Matthew as a genealogical record is given that ultimately Jesus would come through the line of David. What a gracious God. And so just leaving the thought with us that the Lord is saying, I think just very simply, it doesn't matter what you've done. God can and still will use us if we truly come to him. You see, what's what we want to say to the world? Listen, again, it's not about what you've done. It's about what you've repented from and who you've turned to. And we're all in that same boat. Now, I want to look at another man's life today in a little bit different light to see how sin affected him, but much more subtly, much more subtly, because some people will say, well, David's life doesn't have the same connection for me because I haven't gone through those kinds of sins that he went through in the sexual area. So let's look at somebody else today and see if this will make a little bit more impact on you. And so I've titled the message, A Disciple Must Be Prepared for the Unexpected. A disciple must always be prepared for the unexpected. So stand with me as we read these verses in Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26, beginning in 26. For most of you, this will be a very familiar passage. If you don't have your Bible, just take a look at the screen, and it'll be helpful for you there. 
So Matthew writes, while they were eating, Jesus took some bread, and after a blessing, he broke it and gave it to the disciples, which is what we're going to be taking part here in a, in a minute. Take eat, this is my body. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. After singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And then Jesus said to them, You will all fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike down the shepherd and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. But Peter said to him, Even though all may fall away because of you, I will never fall away. And Jesus said to him, Truly I say to you that this very night before a rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And Peter said to him, Even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And all the disciples said the same thing too. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. All right. So you've probably figured out who we're going to look at this morning, and that is Peter. Just for a minute. Let's just get a little bit of clarity on his life for just a moment and remind ourselves of who he was. I would say, in my mind, such a mighty man, really, so capable, so faithful uh, to Jesus, such an incredible companion to the Lord, as we know of him, at least in Scripture, a man filled with confidence, great confidence, a man who left everything to follow this Jesus and really was used greatly by him for the three and a half or the three-year pilgrimage that he was gone with Jesus. He had witnessed the amazing power of God, unlike really any others than the 12 maybe had seen in just some amazing ways, which really, when you summarize it all, just made him an incredible seasoned veteran of the spiritual work of the Lord. I mean, nobody had really been chosen like Peter had, other than James and John, to be kind of the in-group of the 12 disciples that saw even more. Unfortunately, as a result of all he saw and did, Peter became more and more bold. Now, that's not bad in itself, but it's going to cause some problems for him, especially near the end of his life, which is why he became uh, who he did in the garden when the soldiers came to carry Jesus away. You remember what happened? He pulled out his little uh, Gerber knife or whatever it was, we know it's not that. I could tell you exactly what it was. It was a longer knife than that that they would carry and uh, attempted to kill the servant. And instead, he missed and only cut off his ear. But he was really going for his head. And so this was part of his boldness where he was saying, he was reminding Jesus kind of in his actions, see, I told you, I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to deny you. And I'm going to take out every one of these Romans single-handedly if I need to. That was kind of his mindset through all this. Now, just to back up a little bit to give you the context, you remember Jesus has now been arrested. And so after that point, Peter decides to follow him. I think in some ways really trying to live out what he had, had said. So let's jump into verse 69 of Matthew 26 because I want to begin there as we look at just a couple points and how the context lays out for us. So the garden is over now. The soldiers have arrested Jesus, and Peter follows. And we read in verse 69, Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard. Now that's all Matthew says, so we have to look at the other Gospels. And Mark 14, 54 says the courtyard actually belonged to the high priest. He was the Jewish high priest, which also, we're told, was occupied by several servants who were warming themselves by a fire. And as you can imagine... At that point now, and you just kind of picture the scene in your mind, Peter has really taken a pretty big chance here. This is pretty bold of him, a pretty daring move on his part. And this is when Satan was able to blindside him because of what Peter was doing. Because Peter was not expecting, he was not on the alert for what was coming. This is what got him into trouble. Notice in verse 69 and 70, a servant girl came to him and said, You too were with Jesus the Galilean. But he denied it before them all, saying, I don't know what you're talking about. 
Sad, isn't it? Just a few moments, it seems like, before this, Peter was the one who proclaimed so loudly he would never deny. In fact, Luke twenty-two fifty-seven says specifically, Woman, I do not know him. So he first denies to this particular woman, according to Luke's gospel, and then evidently spoke to the others by turning to them and saying, I don't know who you are talking about. So that's kind of a cumulative statement there as he looks at the others gathered around. Again, fascinating, at least in my mind, that Peter immediately went from such a bold servant to one who's ready to die with Jesus to a man who became extremely frightened. You have to scratch your head a little bit and ask the question, what happened here? How could there be such a radical shift? Well, simply, I think, because he had dropped his guard. He had dropped his spiritual guard. In other words, he wasn't paying attention to the Lord's command. You say, what command? Well, if you back up again in the text, Jesus, when they were in the garden, said, I'm going to go over there and pray, and you stay here and do what? Watch and pray. He denied the command of the Lord. Now most Christians, let's talk about us for a second, are very aware of the daily temptations that come against us. I don't think any of us who've been walking with the Lord don't understand that at some point. But it's the ones that we're not looking for. The ones that we're not paying attention to or assuming could be right around the corner to become the problem. And that was Peter's case. I think that was David's case as we just reflect back on him for a second. I think, honestly, and we said this last time when we started the message about David and the hidden sins, I think, honestly, David was just kind of enjoying the day. And we know he wasn't where he was supposed to be, and that was part of the problem of not paying attention. But I think he was very much like this, you know, thinking, I'll just go up on the roof, and I'll check out the view, and everything will be nice, and I think on and on. But that, again, was where he was blindsided. And his flesh got the best of him because he just simply wasn't on his guard. One commentator said this about us as Christians. He said, in much the same way, Christians can plan detailed strategy for evangelism. Listen to how specific we are, and I think he's right about this. Or for the defense of a cherished doctrine or moral standard. In other words, we'll spend lots of time on these kinds of specifics or many other things, only to be confronted by an issue or circumstance they had never considered and for which they are totally unprepared. Like Peter, we, are often, carefully, we often carefully prepare on the basis of our own wisdom and resources while neglecting the guidance of God's Word and the empowering and leading of the Holy Spirit, which he provides through prayer. A person's involuntary, listen to this, a person's involuntary response to the unexpected is a more reliable indicator of his character than his planned reaction to a situation he anticipates. It is when we are caught off guard that our true character is most likely to show itself. Peter's proud self-confidence was his Achilles heel and that, of course, was precisely where Satan aimed his arrow of temptation. Peter's stubborn trust in himself and his unwillingness to fully trust in the Lord made him vulnerable to the simple taunt of a young servant girl. Peter was like Elijah, who was brave when facing the 850 prophets of Baal and Asherah, but who, after he left the mountaintop of victory, foundered in fear over what one woman, Jezebel, might do to him. Peter was a living illustration of Paul's admonition, let him who thinks he stands... Take heed lest he falls, 1 Corinthians 10. In the courtyard of his valiant, protestations were no longer heard, and the arrogant hero shriveled into a cringing coward. His self-preserving instincts prevailed, and his boldness evaporated. Now that's a lot of words to simply say, if you understand the point, we are capable of doing exactly what Peter has done, and as I said a few weeks ago, what David has done. We will often protect ourselves from the big areas of life, right? We usually think about those big areas that we're never going to get involved with, but open ourselves up very widely to the attacks of Satan in the more subtle areas, the areas we're not paying attention to. And I'm talking about the day-to-day -day details of our lives. For example, and there's really a plethora of things that we could talk about here this morning, 
Uh, let me just throw some things out that are on my mind. We assume it's no big deal if I miss a church service every so often. The danger with that is, is that we are such people of habit that we can let the effectiveness of being with one another as God commands us. Remember, it's a commandment for us to gather together regularly. It can become a downhill slide very simply because we're just not paying attention. And we're thinking that if I just allow this one area because it's just not really that big of a deal to creep into my mind, then Satan begins to shoot his arrows at that part of us. Or how about, like we've already talked about, if I don't pray today, it won't matter that much. Now, we all miss our times of prayer. But often, we'll say things just like that. You know, prayer is difficult, it's challenging, uh, it's boring, I don't see a lot of results from it, it's hard, it's it takes time and energy to focus, and so we just have a tendency to let it slide. But can I remind us that this is the avenue, the method, that the Lord says is our greatest connection with Him. It's our communication link. And so Satan, through his subtleties, will come along and he'll say, great, it's exactly what I want you to do. I love to think this in my mind because it makes the most sense to me at least, is that he says, just go to sleep. Just go to sleep. Nine night. Nine night. All right? Go to sleep. Here's another one. It's no big deal, we assume, if I don't get involved in the life of the church. I mean, after all, many people are doing lots of things, and it just seems like the doors are open. I show up here, the lights are on, people are in their places, and it just goes on, yada, yada, yada. And the mind begins to say, it doesn't matter whether I show up there or not. And Satan says, good, good, good. That's what I want you to think. Because then I can remove you much easier, see? So we'll start thinking that they don't really miss me. They don't really need me. So what's the point in really going? And so we don't pay attention to those areas. And we certainly aren't looking for them. We just start to subtly feel them. Here's another one nobody likes to talk about. If I don't offer the Lord a part of my money, no one's going to miss it. Again, you might walk in on a Sunday morning and say the lights are on, the staff is still here, it looks like uh, the ministries are moving on, so what's a few dollars from me? Again, Satan is saying, good, that's exactly what I want you to think. But listen, hear this. It's through the means of money that God's ministries often go on. How many ministries and churches have had to shut down and could no longer, and let's just extrapolate this, no longer go from the simple things of ministry into the reaching of souls for the eternal kingdom and for their best interest eternally? Because a person decided that they didn't want to give a dollar or even more. There's some funny stories out there that really make the point about little kids that have said, well, I don't think my dollar will matter to anything, and they just keep moving that out. Well, your dollar, if you add it to all of the other kids' dollars, become money that could have done this, that could have done this, that could have done this, that could have done this. You see the point. It does make a difference. Here's another one. If I take a few more seconds to look at a person of the opposite sex, what's the big deal? Or somebody who's not my spouse. Well, we don't have to go down that path too far. We've already heard a lot about that. But often we'll just not be paying attention and we'll get captivated by something we shouldn't be a part of. <clears throat> I'll speed up here a little bit. It's no big deal if I don't obey the traffic laws. It's no big deal if I don't record every dime on the company expense sheet. <clears throat> it's no big deal if I don't follow the Lord's commands towards my spouse to love them, submit to them. If I don't obey my parents, what's the big deal? I was at a man's garage one time who kind of covertly and secretly would inspect people's cars without having the inspection license and just would say, well, here, just take this and here, I'll stick it on your car for you. I'm like, okay, you know, a lot of people think and this kind of thing is no big deal. But those are the subtleties, all of these, and I could speak a long time about each one of them and you have many in your minds, I'm sure, of the things that seem to be no big deal that Satan begins to take a very careful aim at 
that causes us to go downhill soon after that. Watch what happens now as we jump back into the text in the beginning of verse 71, how these things can magnify into something greater. So far, it seems like no real big deal, right, of where Peter is. So verse 71, when he had gone out of the gateway, or excuse me, out to the gateway, evidently he's on a move here a little bit, and there's some thoughts that maybe Peter at this, at this point is kind of um, getting more of a sense of the problem that he's finding himself in. Another servant girl saw him and said to those who were there, this man was with Jesus of Nazareth. And again, he denied it with an oath this time. I do not know the man. Again, once again, Peter backing up in this spiritual battle is not prepared for what's happening here because now we're at denial number two that quickly. Not just with a word like he was with the other folks, but now he throws, we're told, this oath in there. Now an oath in a Jewish context was a Jewish way of calling God as the witness. That's what an oath was. Like a person might say in our day, as God is my witness, I do not know the man. That's what Peter's saying here. So it apparently is that Peter is full-blown now, relying upon his flesh. He's really moved very rapidly, not thinking with his spirit, completely following what I would say his own wisdom is at the moment, and his cunning skill, so here's what happens. He's using what is intuitive in the fleshly mind to get himself out of the web that's growing around him. And we're like this as people, is that if we're not constantly being prepared for what may be right around the corner or right in front of us that we're not looking at, the human mind will gravitate towards what it can find the quickest to defend itself. And that's what we're seeing with Peter here. I'll make up something. I'll lie. I'll do whatever I need to do in order to make this look good on me. Because I certainly am not going to be the one caught with my hand in the cookie jar. And that's normal, right? And we would say, yeah, it's normal. And we would all agree it's normal, again, in the fleshly part of us. But not in the spiritual part of us. This kind of reaction is normal when it came to the dealings of life, mainly because he was, remember, a man of pride, a great man of pride and boldness. And so pride has this way of not allowing us to really be honest and truthful. Like we said with David, the easiest thing Peter could have said at this point, even already, and even the first encounter would have been what? Yeah, I'm, I'm one. I know Jesus. But he didn't do that. Because it's all fleshly. He's all trying to protect himself. And again, many Christians respond to unplanned situations very similarly by their normal personality. Often people will say, well, I can't help it. I'm just, it's just the way I am. I mean, and sometimes we'll throw in there, God just made me like this. Right? As if we're blaming God all of a sudden. If you really want to see who the problem is, it's God. Because he made me like this. I just can't help it. And then many, many well-meaning Christians will stand on their own human understanding of God's Word. Understand what I'm saying here. When they stand on their own understanding of God's Word, when they do that, they end up promoting law and legalism a lot of times. Then those who really need the truth, as I was talking about at the very beginning when we were talking about our friend John, who need mercy mixed with a lot of grace, get the bony finger in their face. You see, because we recoil into arrogance in protection of ourselves instead of moving into humility and saying, well, here's what we all need. I'm just as guilty as you are. Yes, your sin may be different from me and from what mine is, but here's what we need. We need Christ. We need Jesus. That's why he came. In other words, what God really wants from all of us is a human humility, just a faithful act of humility. Let's keep moving here because as Peter was relying on his own flesh, the pressure even got worse. Let's look at verse 73 of chapter 26. A little later, 
The bystanders came up and said to Peter, Surely you too are one of them, and even the way you talk gives you away. And notice what happens in Peter now. Then he began to curse and swear. I do not know the man. I know why you're laughing, because this is so close to home, isn't it? What started out as such an incredible time of courage and a desire to help the Lord soon now has turned out to be a huge faith test for Peter. And unfortunately, he's really miserably failing the test, calling down curses on himself. To curse is what he's really saying here, again in the Jewish context, is not only is he calling out God as a witness to him, which is the oath part again, but now he's calling out a death sentence on himself. That's what he's saying. If I'm lying, may God kill me right now. That's what Peter's saying. As God is my witness, kill me now, Lord, if I'm lying. One commentator said, and perhaps the most serious taking of the Lord's name in vain that is conceivable, Peter said, in essence, may God kill and damn me if I'm not speaking the truth. So where's Peter now? He's totally overcome and overwhelmed by his flesh and the circumstances, the pressures of it all, which again is where the flesh is often at, at its highest point of being tempted. I mean, he is just, the pump has been primed by Satan now, and he's just ready to go down in a burning flame. And it was just at that moment when we read this, immediately the rooster crowed. Immediately the rooster crowed. According to Luke's gospel, twenty two sixteen, it was then that Jesus made eye contact with Peter. Can you imagine that scene? Can you imagine the grief and the despair that was heaped upon Peter at that moment when he made the contact with Jesus? You can almost see the, the Lord going like this, right? I see you, Peter. But the Lord didn't need to do that because they were locked on and Peter would never forget that gaze of the Lord. I'm sure with grace, grace and compassion, but if you can imagine that scene. It was just horrendous. Now, let's just finish this up with a couple thoughts here, and that is to ask the question, what was really going on with Peter? That becomes the real question for us because we have to search our own hearts in these situations. We have to ask ourselves the question, why do we shift so quickly in various things? Well, of course, we know it's the flesh. We understand that, but let's just look at Peter's life a little bit more. And I think we've already said this in some ways, but let me make it this way. As you see in your outline, he had too much confidence in himself. That really was the beginning of it all. Back in verse 33 of the same chapter, 26 of Matthew, Peter said to him, Even though all may fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Now that is a great statement that you want everybody to say who is a true believer of the Lord. I will never Never, never deny you. Now, folks, let's be honest. Have you denied the Lord this week? Have you? I'll be the first one to raise my hand. You say, preacher, you denied the Lord this week? <laughs> yeah, it's true. You know how I did that? There were times when the Lord said that I needed to pray, and I didn't stop to pray. Because I got a little too busy with things. Right? I didn't obey the traffic laws perfectly. I try, But I didn't do it. I wasn't a perfect husband this week. I try, But I wasn't. I wasn't a perfect dad. I wasn't a perfect neighbor. You see? I denied the Lord. And we think that that's no big deal. But it is a big deal. And so just imagine the Lord every time we deny Him. I'm seeing you. I see you. But this is when His grace overwhelms us. And His grace is just so beautiful. Peter, in this particular point in his life, in this moment, was fighting against the Lord's will. 
Because Jesus said to them all, you will fall away. Now watch this. Jesus said to him, Peter, listen, you all will fall away. Now who was this coming from? It wasn't the janitor or the water boy. This was coming from the Lord himself. He said, Peter, you're going to fall away. But Peter was denying all of that. And we see that by his actions because he had too much self-confidence. He rejected the plan of the Lord. He thought he was incapable of disloyalty. He believed that he was too mature. He had been with Jesus for three years. He was one of the inner sanctum, the inner three. And he was too faithful to be vulnerable. And again, just reiterating the same point, beloved, that's exactly an opportunity for Satan to penetrate our hearts. When we think we're okay, dangerous, dangerous, dangerous ground to be on in our hearts. When we start thinking we can't be tempted or assume we can't be tempted in certain areas, dangerous ground, dangerous ground. Because we just have too much confidence in ourselves, we may say, I've prayed about all this and I've asked for God's divine protection over my heart. And so we kind of let it slip through the cracks as if it's never going to be an issue. When reality says we need to be cautious all the time. When David went up on the roof, he should have been thinking, I've got to protect my eyes. He should have remembered what Job said, which was, I've made a covenant with my eyes never to look at a woman lustfully. But he didn't. He thought everything was okay. Peter should have said, Lord, show me how to keep from denying you. Wouldn't that have been a better statement? Instead, he stands up in his arrogance and says, Lord, here's how much I love you. I'm going to go to the death with you. And Jesus says, Peter, listen, you don't understand what you're talking about. You are going to fall away. And so, similarly, I think, if we ever take our eyes off the Lord and we think that we're not going to ever fall, we are great, greatly opening ourselves to the work of Satan. We can't ever deny the words of the Lord. The Lord tells us, in the epistles, if nothing else, from Paul's writings, that we are to guard our hearts, guard ourselves regularly. You say, well, yeah, I am in the big stuff. No, this is the point of today. We've got to guard ourselves in the little things of the day, the tiny things of the day, because they will become bigger things in the day if we're not extremely careful. So we're to submit to the Lord, even if we don't like what he says. Peter didn't like what he said. He didn't like it that Jesus said, you're going to fall away. So he was seeking to prove Jesus wrong. And we can't do that. We have to listen to what the Lord says. We should be asking the Lord, what do you want from me, Lord? How do I live according to your commandments? Keep my eyes focused on you, Lord, not what I think ought to happen here. All right, so that was number one. Here's the second thing. Peter was so confident in his own spiritual strength, he failed to pray. And again, we've already touched on this, so we'll be brief. In other words, Peter's denial began by not praying. Now, over and over again, we look at this in Scripture, and we talk about this from our own selves. When we don't pray, what that does is it leads us to dependence on ourself. That's the fallout. When we're not praying regularly, with each other, and privately throughout our day, we are saying literally to God, I don't need you through this part. I can do it. I can handle it. And for the most part, you've baked cookies 15,000 times a day, or through your year, rather, your years. And you say, I don't need you to help me with the cookies, Lord. And then all of a sudden, you find yourself with a burnt finger. When the Lord might be saying, you know, if you'd have just asked me to help you and not be so dependent on yourself, then maybe that wouldn't have happened. Now, I'm not saying accidents come because we just don't pray. We live in a sinful world with broken things, and so we're victims of a lot of brokenness. But I hope you understand the point. Paul says to the church in Thessalonica, pray without ceasing. Don't depend on yourself. You need me in every situation. To the Ephesians, he said, with all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. And with this in view, 
Notice this, Paul says to the church in Ephesus, be on the alert with all perseverance and petitions for all the saints. We cannot ever let our guard down and prayer is the function that God has given to us to help us the most. Now I mentioned this earlier, this prayerlessness we're talking about with Peter now occurred back in the Garden of Gethsemane. You can go back to chapter 26 and verses 36 through 40, which we're not going to read to see all of that where the situation was not serious enough to evidently keep the disciples awake. In other words, Jesus very clearly says their flesh was much stronger than their spirits. And you say, well, I've been in that situation before. Praying's hard. I mean, sometimes when the pastor's talking too long, I have a hard time staying awake. Well, we understand all of that. And so there's a part of us that wants to say back to Jesus, can you kind of give the boys a break here a little bit? I mean, after all, they've been traipsing all over the world with you. Uh, they've, I mean, this is stressful, Jesus. Right? I mean, come on. Do you know how hard this is? This is a tough life. Give me a break here. Give the boys a break. And I think Jesus did give them a break, certainly, because he simply says, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He understood. He understood the problem. In the disciples' case, Jesus knew what was about to happen, that they would desert him, so he warned them. Watch and pray. You're going to leave. You're going to abandon the ship. You're going to abandon everything that I said to you, so watch and pray. But it wasn't evidently enough to keep them engaged. And I would say the same thing about us. The point is, the Lord doesn't command us to stay awake in a heart of prayer for nothing. It's for our own good. Listen, the reason that we come together, beloved, to pray and we call on you to join us in prayer is not just so we can occupy some time in your life. It's because there's some spiritual benefit that comes from it, individually and corporately. Because we understand that this is the link that we must have. We are in constant and total dependence on the Lord for everything. And when we start making decisions for our lives outside of prayer, an inclusion of God, then we're going to get ourselves into a lot of trouble or potentially get ourselves into a lot of trouble because the flesh will drift off into its fleshly sleep and just go about its normal part of the day, which will become denial of Jesus. It will become insubordination. And think about this in the truest sense of everything that Jesus is and he stands for. We are servants of his kingdom, right? We're slaves to a benevolent, loving master, the most, the benevolent master of all masters. But yet we are to pay attention because if we don't, we will rebel against him even though we're born again. Jesus said, in fact, through Paul, Galatians 5, Paul writes this, walk in the spirit and you won't carry out the desires of the flesh. You see that? That walk is to be continuous in it. Don't let your guard down. And we've read through these verses before. You can see the difference between the flesh and the spirit very, very carefully there, very clearly. I mentioned these last time, the sexual sins, the spiritual sins, the relational sins. And we've got this catalog for us of things that the Lord is saying to us. If you don't pay attention, these are the things you will surely find yourself involved in. And again, unfortunately, like Peter, we will say, oh, no, 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 no. That's not going to be me. I'm not going to get involved in that kind of stuff. I'm not going to be one who falls away like that. Well, okay, I wish we had the people up here who said that in their lifetime and ended up falling away. All right, thirdly, Peter failed the Lord because he didn't like the Lord's plan to save the world. In other words, Peter didn't believe the Lord and what the Lord told him would happen. He just mentioned this. For example, Jesus not only said they'd all deny him, he also said that the disciples would have to suffer and die. Peter didn't like that. Now let's rewrite the script, Lord. That's not, a good, that's not a really good plan. That's not a good ending to all of this. I don't think the producer's going to like that. You know, it's just not going to look good on camera. Um, people won't watch if it ends that way. It's just not going to happen. And so he tried to tell Jesus what was wrong with all of that by his actions. And he took the matters into his own hands. That's what he did, right? We've already covered this. Trying to kill the servant of the high priest. Basically, if you could read the dialogue, you know the narrator's comments? It would be, 
in parenthesis right here, don't like this Jesus, going to swing at the servant's ear now, okay, while he's actually going through it. You know, as you watch the plays, you see the, hear the, that in the background. Laughter here, sadness here, sorrow here, joy here. Peter is angry here when they come to arrest Jesus. <clears throat> it's like Peter was saying, I know you said this is going to happen, over my dead body. Okay? So, since I don't like that, I'm going to try to fix this myself. Which again is just a terrible lack of faith. And a denial of human authority and godly authority. Because we know what Peter didn't know, which was Jesus had to be arrested. Didn't he know? Let's think about this for just a second. Look at the goodness of the Lord through all of this. He had to say to Peter, Peter, no, look, you're going to deny me, but Peter, what you don't understand is I have a plan in this. You don't really see the outlying part of the story here. I have to be arrested. I have to be tried. I have to die. I have to be resurrected so that you can live. But Peter couldn't see any of that. And folks, listen, the point is we don't see a lot of what God is doing in our lives either. The point is, God is writing us into the story of his work. Whether we like the script or not, those of you who've been with us on Wednesday nights know that we talked about this a lot. A lot of times we'll take up the pen and we'll just jerk it out of God's hand and we'll say, nope, don't like that, don't like that, don't like that. Here's the way it's going to end. And we'll give the pen back to God. And we do exactly what Peter does, and then we open up ourselves to potential problems because the Lord says, no, this has to happen this way in order for this to happen over here and for that to happen over there, and on and on and on it goes. And so we have to trust him. Finally, Peter failed the Lord because he put himself in a very compromising situation. I want you to listen to this very carefully. Peter allowed himself to be in a place, and I'm talking about physically, where he was not capable of handling it. He should have never gone there because he wasn't prepared to go there. He should have never gone to the courtyard because the Lord told him what was going to happen. But he didn't listen to that. He should have been trying to find a way to stop it. All of that was disobedience. Notice in verses 52 through 54. Jesus said to him, this was back in the garden, put your sword back into its place, Peter, for all those who take up the sword shall perish by the sword. Now listen, here's the point. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? How then will the scriptures be fulfilled which say that it must happen this way? Peter knew. He knew. But he still let his flesh subtly creep in there. Why did he do that? I think he was really unsure. He heard the Lord, but he was unsure, and that's why he denied that he was one of the disciples. When the fire really came close to him, not the fire that he was standing near, but when the fire of the accusations came near him, he was totally unprepared for that. And it's because he wasn't where he was supposed to be. It was because he was overconfident. He was that he didn't obey the Lord in prayer. He didn't just flat out listen to what the Lord had said. And so the point is, folks, listen, we should never, ever assume that we will be okay in any situation unless we are 100% confident we can withstand the temptation, no matter what it is that comes. Now, Peter said that too. And so the moral of the story would be, we are never 100% confident, are we? That's why no matter where we are, what we're doing, we have to be looking for the temptations to come against our flesh, no matter what it is or where we are. You say, even in church? Absolutely. You say, well, I can see how it could happen out in the world, but it even happens within the church. It applies to places where we go. It applies to people that we're with. It applies to things that we do, whether it's movies, TV shows, certain kinds of music. That's not being legalistic. 
Listen to what you want to listen to, of course, as it aligns itself with the Word of God. Just be humbly aware of your insecurities. Pay attention to them. People will say, well, you just have to conquer your fears. That's the problem. You just need to get over it. Well, all that's true, but only as long as you know that you can 100% depend on the Lord to get through the temptation. Otherwise, let me just say it's just stupid. It's just stupid to put yourself in any kind of scenario, any kind of dialogue, whatever may be, that's going to cause some kind of issues. You have to ask yourself the question, Lord, is this the right thing to say right here? Is this the right place to go at this moment? Is this the best thing to do in this scenario or this situation? You say, really? i got to live my life like that? No, you don't have to. But just read the book and you'll figure out what happens to people who don't live like that. They become food for Satan. Thankfully, Peter got the point. Verse 75, Peter remembered the word which Jesus said. Isn't that great? Before a rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And notice what he did. He went out and he wept bitterly. He wept bitterly. And Peter remembered. And that remembering caused him to be so sorrowful. He didn't just cry in an intellectual way. But that's the what the text is saying to us is that he repented. He wept bitterly. And what's so beautiful about this, and this is such a beautiful picture of the Lord, is that later God would use him so greatly. Just wonderfully. At the time of Pentecost, you remember, as the Spirit of God comes onto the scene, Jesus is gone now. He's ascended into heaven, and the Lord promised he would bring the Holy Spirit or send the Holy Spirit. And the context is just that. And so Peter, people are questioning what's going on here. You know, some of these people are drunk and what's, what's happening? This is just crazy foolishness stuff here. And Peter launches into the greatest sermon ever preached. And hearts were convicted. Let me just read you this portion in Acts chapter 2, verse 37. When they heard Peter's sermon, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off. Who is that? That's you and me, right? As many as the Lord our God will call to himself, and with many other words he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. So then, those who had received his word were baptized, and that day there were added about 3,000 souls. That day, 3,000 souls. I want to leave us that way because I think it's critically important that we all, because we often hear about the sinfulness of our lives, we miss the grace of God often. And I don't know about you, but as I put myself in the place of Peter and I see the Lord's gazing eyes at me, I never want to deny him, do you? I mean, would you ever purposefully want to deny the Lord? Of course you wouldn't. You would never agree to that. But beloved, I just have to say to us again is that we often deny the Lord. But he's so gracious to us. He's so kind. If we will do what the Lord says. Peter hung in there. Remember Judas? Judas's heart was never with the Lord. Text tells us that clearly. He went out and hanged himself after he did what he did because he was remorseful, the text tells us. But he was never repentant. He was just sorry that he had done it. But he never really gave up his heart. For those who give up their hearts, we feel the sting of what we do, and we should. We should feel the conviction of not living the life that God wants us to do, to be a part of and to live. We feel the conviction of stupid things, and sometimes we just hope they're going to go away. But they never go away. They're to be brought out to the Lord, because God will always bring it out, as we saw in our last one. Maybe not right away, but he will bring it out. Remember, we saw that with David's life. Proverbs 28, 13, He who conceals his transgressions will not prosper. Now, know what you're thinking. You're thinking, well... 
But God is gracious and he'll overlook some of these things. That's not what his word says. Jesus said to Peter, you're going to deny me, Peter. Nope, not going to do it, Lord. So we hear the same thing. But listen to the Lord. But he who confesses and forsakes them will find compassion. Compassion. Confess means to throw away, to cast out, to remove from. Throw away the sin. Cast it away from you. The New Testament word of that is to agree with God. That's what confession means. I agree with you, Lord, that I'm the problem. That's what David had to do. Forsake means to abandon, desert, leave. So you cast it out and you run from it. Forsake all that is behind you in a sinful sense. And so Peter needed to decide that was the will of the Lord and not try to fix his life himself. Now listen, I can't say what God's going to do in your situation, but what I can say is that for each of us, as we will live according to what the Lord has said in the subtle things of our lives, God will have great compassion for us if we live a life of confessing and forsaking. That's the key. We have to be daily on our guard and do everything that the Lord has commanded us to do so that we don't slip into our flesh, which we will. We've got to stop it before it gets started. And we stop it by paying attention and always making sure that we're listening to the Lord. So if you've heard what the Lord has said, then simply confess, repent of it. Otherwise, very clearly inside the spiritual box is God will have to judge it because of his holiness. Amen? All right, let's praise him in prayer. Father, we come to you now thanking you and praising you for your goodness to us. Thank you for the examples that you leave with us. Example of, examples of real men. Men who are after your own heart, who walked with you and lived with you and communicated with you and felt your presence and saw your work far greater than things we've ever seen in our lifetime. But Lord, how they were easily given in to the things and the temptations of their flesh. Even to deny the very Lord Jesus to his face. And Lord, we don't have to look very far down the pipe to see ourselves. And just be reminded that we're not being cast away into some devil's hell because we make a mistake. And I'm talking about as believers, true children of yours. But we can easily become great victims of Satan if we're not paying attention. So help us, Lord. Moment by moment, no matter what we're doing or where we are, that we fully embrace you through prayer and the understanding of your word as we apply it to our hearts on a regular basis, as we study it, we feed upon it, we hear it and listen so that you can retrieve it and recoil it back to us when we need it most. Lord, help us as your people. Give us a convicting message in our heart when we're about to do something that may be outside of your will. Lord, we understand that we are not the perfect ones that you are. And you love us and you have great mercy and compassion. So help us to follow you according to what you have said. Thank you for the Lord Jesus for giving his life that we may be set free forever. For it's in him we put our trust and our confidence and our hope. We pray this in his name. Amen. If we could have our...